Hi, I'm David Kasnoff, and this is a Kodak close-up. Tomaso Reyes' passport says he's a U.S. citizen, but his photographs speak to an international experience. He shares untold stories of life in Rwanda, Indonesia, Cuba, Iraq, and Europe. Stories you can see online at www.damaso.com. In today's Kodak close-up, Damaso tells us of his rise from street photography in New York City to photojournalism to documentary photography. And he tells us how Kodak film helps bring him closer to his work. So here now, a Kodak close-up with Damaso Reyes. When I was 16, I actually started working uh, for a local newspaper, the Amsterdam News, as a freelance photographer and got some pictures published. And for me, that moment of seeing my first pictures in print and realizing that, you know, 40,000 or 50,000 other people would also see my photographs and see my name in the little tiny type that they use for, uh, for bylines and photo credits. I just fell in love with the idea that I could influence the way that other people see the world. Because as a photographer, um, the camera serves in a lot of ways as a mediator. Um, I photograph in a lot of difficult situations, a lot of post-conflict situations. I photograph a lot of things which are disturbing. And for me, the camera is a buffer through which I can process those experiences. So. The experience doesn't hit me as hard because I'm focusing on my work, I'm focusing on composition and trying to communicate what I'm seeing to someone who's not there, someone who might not even be born yet. So for me, the act of photography actually acts as a kind of filter to reality so that while I may find myself in some very difficult situations, I'm not bearing the full brunt of that experience. I actually, the camera and the film I use or the digital sensors actually acting as something like a filter for me. The second time I went to Rwanda, um, I went to cover the 10th anniversary of the genocide. I had gone five years earlier uh, with a colleague to document how that country was dealing with the aftermath of the genocide, which killed more than a million people. And, you know, I definitely have an obligation as a photojournalist and as a documentary photographer to tell stories for people who can't tell those stories themselves and also to people who can't go to the places that I go. So I feel like the photographer is a, is a bridge between the viewer and the subject. But I also had to realize that I had to take care of the bridge. In essence, I had to take care of my own mental health. We were at this small community, and essentially the people in the community were excavating the mass grave. This wasn't people, forensic scientists from the United Nations. These were the friends, neighbors, in many cases family members of victims who were trying to find their loved ones and give them a proper burial. And I recall um, people recognizing their family members from what they were wearing. The clothing was still intact, and they, they would say, oh, that's Joy. That's Joy's dress. Um, and that really, that really affected me in a profound way to watch these people go through this process and to be, to be allowed to document it. And I recall after maybe two hours and I had shot maybe 15 rolls of film, I, you know, I turned to my friend uh, who's a writer and I said, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I don't, I don't need to photograph anymore. I don't want to photograph anymore. That's something I think that a lot of photographers are dealing with, especially those who work in active conflict zones like Iraq and Afghanistan, that we also suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. So. It's something that um, I don't think gets talked about enough, and it's certainly something that you don't necessarily learn in college or university or even until you're in a situation like that. But, um, you know, if you're going to serve as a bridge between your viewers and your subjects, you need to take care of yourself. You don't want to be in a position where your work burns you out after five or ten years, which all too often happens for photographers who are working in high-stress environments.
post-conflict work and uh, crisis work is not all that I do. It's not even the majority of what I do, certainly not today. So I think the first thing is finding a balance in your work. Um, if you're, all you're doing is covering conflict zones, uh, that can be problematic. I think that we need to look to the history of photography to really answer that question. You look at the person who's considered the greatest war photographer of all time, Robert Capa, he spent time photographing Hollywood celebrities. He spent time uh, photographing Picasso walking down the beach. Yes, he covered the Spanish Civil War. Yes, he covered the landings at Normandy, but he himself enjoyed skiing and you know talking to beautiful women and having a good drink. So um, I try to keep that in mind. I try to balance my workload, especially if I know that I'm going into a high stress environment. As many sacrifices as I make to do the work that I do, I realize that it's important for me to be a good photographer, to be someone who can capture those moments. I need to experience those moments myself. There are times when I'm looking at a beautiful sunset or looking at a fireworks display and I don't pick up the camera, I, le I let the camera sit because I want to experience the moment without that buffer, without that filter of the camera, without wondering what f-stop I should be shooting at, and I just want to enjoy the sunset. There aren't too many films that Kodak makes that I don't like, uh, but you know, there are some that I use more than others. I certainly use a lot of Portra when I'm doing color film work, and um, I've used Ektar, and I really love Ektar. In fact, one of my photographs uh, was used in an ad campaign. Uh, f to promote Ektar, so I'm a big fan of Ektar, but I probably shoot a couple of hundred rolls of tri a year. You know, for me, the decision of whether to use film or whether to do digital is um, primarily based on what I'm shooting and why I'm shooting it. If I'm in a situation where I need a fast turnaround time, then digital is often the solution that I choose. If I'm looking for something that's perhaps more ar archival or I want to work in a slower manner, then oftentimes I shoot film. But for me, there is no A or B. There's no right answer to the question of what should I, what should I use to capture my image. It's really a question of circumstance. It's a question of what's the best tool for the project that you're working on. So when I began working on my long-term photographic documentary project, The Europeans, I was faced with this very decision. I knew that I was going to be working on a project for a number of years, and I had to decide what format I was going to shoot that in. And I seriously considered shooting the project digitally, because digital has some advantage. I, wouldn't have the same storage issues, um, I wouldn't have the same post-production uh, challenges that film uh, can present. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that for me this was going to be a, the largest project I'd probably ever work on. And it was probably going to be the most significant project. And for me, one of the largest issues that I had to face was that of consistency. Uh, back in 2005, the digital market was still expanding and growing rather quickly. So at that time, the best camera you could get was maybe uh, 10 or 12 megapixels. Today, you can certainly on a 35, you can go upwards of 20 megapixels. The challenge that I didn't want to have when I was putting together a book or an exhibition was to have a file from 2005 that was 10 megabytes and a file from 2013 that was 30 or 40 megabytes and sit there and say, well, I can make a large print of this, but I can't make a large print of that. When you shoot film, you have a baseline which is consistent over time. One of the things that I love about Kodak products is that they're the same today as they were yesterday. The tri that I'm shooting today, I can be confident that it's the same formula, it's the same structure, the same, the same grain pattern that the tri I was shooting seven years ago was. So that when my viewers are looking at the prints that I do, or they're looking at a book that I produce, they're not saying, well, I think he shot that on a six megapixel camera, or that was surely shot on an eight megapixel camera. They're not, wor they're not distracted by the inside baseball of what was used to capture that image. They're looking at the image.